All right, Genesis chapter 44. Appreciate Brother Chris leading last week, even though his voice was just about gone. And uh, I was out of town, and I appreciate him stepping up to the plate. Always, as always, heard he did a wonderful job. Let me mention again that if you have a place of business or you know a place of business that would allow us to put these uh, posters up of Mission Point Jubilee, this is really our last chance to do so. So these are back at the Welcome Center. You can grab some of those and uh, help us put those up this week and get the word out about that. That would, that would be wonderful. As we come to chapters uh, 44 and 45 this week and next Wednesday, there's no way I'm getting through them both tonight, but they do go together, and so I wanted to present them together. I want to take just a moment to review because I do see some new faces and uh, perhaps those that will be watching this by recording, just to kind of bring you up to speed that we are studying the life of Joseph. We're looking at Genesis 37 through 50 as we do so. Joseph was... Of course, the favored son of Jacob and his brothers resented him. They hated him because of this. And so they seek to get rid of him, at first seeking to kill him. And then, uh, based on the rec recommendation of Judah, they sell him into slavery. At the age of 17, he is sold into slavery. He's taken to Egypt. By the providence of God, he is sold into the household of Potiphar, who was a leader in Egypt under the Pharaoh. And there in Potiphar's ha house, Joseph rises to great power, great leadership. Leadership. He is second in authority only to Potiphar. But as you know, Joseph is pursued by Potiphar's wife. She seeks to have an affair with Joseph. Joseph resists that, but he is lied upon, and then he is thrown into prison. It is in that prison that Joseph comes into contact with the chief butler and the chief baker of the Pharaoh, and they have a dream simultaneously, the same night, two dreams. They have no idea what those dreams mean, and so Joseph hears about it, and he interprets those dreams by the power of God. That was good news for the butler. It was bad news for the baker. The butler was released and sent back to Pharaoh's uh, palace where he, his job would be given back to him. The butler or the baker would be hanged. Joseph, you remember, asks the butler, hey, when you get out of here, remember me. Uh, I, I, allowed you, I interpreted the dreams and allowed you to get out of here, so remember me. And we know, again, by the providence of God, that the butler forgot Joseph and that Joseph would spend two more years in that prison where God was continuing to develop him and develop the leadership skills that he would need in the days ahead. And then after two years, at last, Pharaoh also has a dream. And he calls for all the magicians in Egypt to come and to interpret this dream. None of them can interpret it. And, of course, the butler being around the Pharaoh hears about this. And automatically, his memory is triggered. And he remembers that there was a man back in prison who could interpret dreams. And so he tells Pharaoh about him. And Pharaoh sends for Joseph, uh, finally... He comes, and by the Spirit of God again, Joseph is able to interpret the dream from Pharaoh. And he is again, uh, because of that, now granted great leadership underneath Pharaoh's leadership in Egypt. And he rises to second in power under the Pharaoh. He is now Potiphar's boss. And now as the famine arrives, as he predicted that it would in the dream, he is brought before his brothers who sold him into slavery because the famine has spread now uh, to Canaan. It has reached Canaan and his brothers are coming now to Egypt to, to, get, to get grain. In chapter 42 where Brother Chris was last week, we read of the brothers' first trip to, to Egypt as the famine was spreading and Joseph begins a series of tests with his brothers and he holds Simeon as a prisoner to ensure that they return with his only full-blooded brother Benjamin. He recognizes them. They do not recognize him. They still do not know who he is. Uh, the brothers begin to believe that their, 
their current predicament is a result of their, their, their guilt for selling Joseph into slavery. And they are filled with remorse. They, they're filled with some regret, but still not repentance. And they return back home with the grain. But they struggle to convince their father Jacob to let them bring Benjamin back. Because now Benjamin is the favored son of Judah. And so in chapter 43, with the famine worsening and them really, it was either send Benjamin or them starve. Jacob reluctantly agrees to send him uh, with the brothers back to Egypt along with gifts and twice the money to repay what was returned to them on their first trip. And when the brothers arrive the second time, Joseph invites them in for a dinner, treating them with kindness. Of course, when he sees Benjamin, his only full-blooded brother, he is filled with emotion. He begins to, to weep, uh, and he, he uh, gives him, a, again, another test. He gives him five times the portion at the meal of all the other brothers. Now, Kim and I have gone to restaurants before. I shared with our faith group Sunday, and sometimes we order the same thing, and for some reason, she always gets the larger portion. Um, but five times, I mean, it's very obvious to the brothers, right? This, something's not right here. He, he purposely favors him as another test to the, to the brothers to see if their heart has changed. Since 20 years ago, they gladly sold him out and gave him up and sold him into, into slavery. So now the stage is set for a possible reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers. And listen, there is so much to learn in these two chapters. I don't want to rush through it because in every section there is a very, very important principle. I've divided it up into four different parts. And again, I'm not sure how far we will make it, but I think at least through the first two points. The first thing that I want you to see that God is doing is the purge of self-confidence that happens in the brothers. So let's read together the first 17 verses as we continue of chapter 44. And he commanded the steward of his house saying, and this is Joseph, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack's mouth and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, Benjamin, And his corn money, and he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up and follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this... It in which my Lord drinks, and whereby indeed he divineth or practices divination. Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? Where are you you getting this? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless, or The rest of you will be let go. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and he began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid it every man his donkey and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house for he was yet there and they fell down before him on the ground. Again, this is a fulfillment of Joseph's dreams. This, I, I believe this is the fourth time that we see this happen. Verse 15, And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? 
Were ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine or practice divination? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. So in these first 17 verses, we, we witness a very pivotal moment, I believe, in the life of Joseph's brothers, where at last God deals with their self-confidence. God brings them to a place of shattering any confidence that they might have in themselves. Directed by the Spirit of God, Joseph sets a test for them again. And through that test, he reveals how inadequate their own strength and their own understanding is without full dependence on God. And great confidence here in the text I'm sure they confidently volunteered to be sold into slavery and have whoever had stolen this cup killed if any of them are found guilty of stealing. And that self-confidence, I can just assume, had to have grown as they began to go down from the sons, from Reuben to, to Levi, all the way down. Judah is cleared, and then Dan is cleared, and all the other brothers are cleared, and they get down to Benjamin. Of all the people, surely Benjamin is not the thief. I mean, he wasn't even involved in the, the selling of Joseph into slavery, but Benjamin's bag is open, and the grain is sifted, and suddenly the bright... Egyptian sun flashes and that silver cup uh, is seen and the steward draws forth this special cup. And despite all the protest of the brothers, the cup is there and Benjamin is found guilty. Although, listen, although the brothers were innocent, although they were not guilty of this crime, they were all guilty of a far more blameworthy crime and sin. And it was that sin that God was now uncovering. Judah recognizes that, doesn't he, in verse number 16. Look at it again. What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? Then notice this statement. God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Yes, innocent of the, 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 the theft of Joseph's cup, but irrevocably guilty of selling Joseph into slavery and lying to their father. And this is what God is now dealing with. Up to this point, the brothers had become confident, don't miss this, they had become confident in their ability to dismiss their former sin, which they had never confessed publicly and, and repented of. So they had become confident in their ability to keep that thing covered up and focus on their good qualities that they now had in their life. Now, there's application for that for us, isn't there? Because like the brothers in our natural man, we think that our successes earned by our own abilities and our own intellect and our own hard work are the things that God will recognize and use. And it is a great insight when that natural self-confidence, confidence in ourself, is crushed, is broken, and we find ourselves completely dependent upon the good mercy of God. And God had to strip everything from these brothers' lives for them to come to this point where they no longer had any self-confidence they could only throw themselves on the mercy of God. And it is often the helplessness that we find ourselves in in this life that brings us to a place where we can be restored. For 22 years now, Joseph's brothers have lived with a terrible secret that caused them to constantly be looking over their shoulders to see who would find out. Every time Egypt was mentioned, every time Joseph was mentioned, their conscience would rise up. 
And there's so many wonderful biblical truths and principles for us to learn from this. Although no one but them knew about their sin, who did know about their sin? God always knew about their sin. And he would continue to pursue them and expose their sin and bring them to a place of complete dependence upon him. He would strip away every stitch of self-confidence that they had. And by doing so, God is bringing them to the place of open confession and public repentance. The Bible says, whoso covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes his sin shall have what? Mercy. Mercy. In other words, it's very unwise to continue to try to cover up your sin. But if you will confess it, if I will confess it and forsake it, we will find the mercy of God. And that is what God is bringing these brothers to. The final blow with Benjamin will demolish any strand of self-confidence that they have. And by the way, this is where they will find freedom. This is where they will find forgiveness. This is where they will find restoration. It is only in the death of self that we can be spiritually reborn. Do you understand that? It is only in realizing that we can't save ourselves, that there's nothing good in and of ourselves. And we throw ourselves at the mercy and grace of God that God will then say, now you're in a place where I can save you. We have to first acknowledge that we are guilty, that we are sinful. And it is a reminder to us that God sometimes allows situations to unfold that reveal the true state of our hearts that we so often try to keep hidden. And the brothers had had previously boasted about their innocence and their integrity, but now they're faced with a situation that's out of their control. They believe that they were in in the clear And listen, our self-confidence often blinds us to areas of weakness in our character. Guard against it. We like to see the best in ourselves, don't we? Only through surrendering these areas to God can we grow in humility and trust. Only when we come to the place where David said, where truly he prayed, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me and show me the ugliness of my heart, only then will we have the blessings of God. Only then will we see true restoration The brothers were confident in the fact that they had told the truth, that they had had sufficient money to pay for the grain. They were confident of their integrity, but they were guilty of unconfessed sin in their past. We may be innocent of some small sins for which we pride ourselves. And like the publican in the New Testament, we may pride ourselves in our fasting and our giving and our church attendance, yet we are guilty of great pride before God. And unless a person confesses and repents of that sin, it will condemn them eternally to hell in a place separated from God. Even Benjamin, the seemingly innocent one in the narrative, needed to be purged of whatever self-confidence that he may have had in himself. I love what F.B. Meyer said here. He tells a story talking about this text that we're looking at, and he says, a preacher of the gospel was once speaking to an old Scotswoman who was often regarded as one of the most devout and respectable people in that part of the country. I think this is a very important story for those of us who grew up in the Bible Belt, who grew up in church, who grew up kind of thinking that we're all right. We're Southerners. We're we're church attenders. He says he was impressing on her, this lady, her need for Jesus, and at last... With tears in her eyes, she said, Oh, sir, I've never missed a Sabbath, and I've read my Bible every day, and I have prayed and done good deeds to my neighbors, and I have done all I knew I ought to do, and now do you mean to tell me that all all of that was for nothing? And he answered, Well, you have to choose. Listen, you have to choose between trusting in these and trusting the redemption which God offers you in Christ. You cannot have both. 
If you are content to part company with your own righteousness, the Lord will give you his. I love that. Let me say it again. If you are content to part company with your own righteousness, the Lord will give you his. But if you cling to your Bible reading and Sabbath keeping and good deeds, the Lord's righteousness cannot be yours. He says it was quite a spectacle to see that that woman's face. For some time, she sat in silence with her elbows on the table, her face buried in her hands. A great struggle was going on within, and at last, the tears began to stream from her eyes. And lifting up her clasped hands to heaven, she cast herself on her knees and accepted the righteousness of Jesus alone for her salvation. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And even maybe the most innocent amongst them, the the good one, the young one, Benjamin, surely he was not guilty, and yet he is a picture of this. In the same way, it's when the cup is found in Benjamin's bag that he too is brought to his knees before God. And I want you to think about this statement this evening that often is hard for us to get into our minds. That defeat is victory. I don't know if you agree with that or not when you first hear it. When a person is first presented with this divine logic for the first time, it sounds wrong. Yet it wasn't until the final breaking and defeat of the brothers' self-righteousness and their confidence that they were healed. Before this moment, they had been running from God while covering up their sin. And when God had made his presence felt through the return of their money on the first trip to Egypt, remember back in Genesis 42, they acknowledged that God was at work in their life. You remember verse 28, it says, And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? What is God doing? But it was still in the form of a question. They still had not openly confessed and repented of their sin. But now in our text in verse number 16, it's no longer in a question. It is in a statement. God has uncovered our sin. No doubt about it. This is God revealing our sin and now God has won the victory in their defeat of their self-confidence and I believe that from here these are transformed men we see how a right relationship with God causes a change in their relationship with other people and I don't want you to miss this here is the test of whether they are changed men or not would the brothers save their own skins and let Benjamin go Like they did Joseph? Would they step aside and and see Benjamin go off to slavery while they went back free? Would they come up with another story to tell their father of how this time it was Benjamin who had been killed by an animal or whatever it is? Would they pretend that a wild animal had devoured him Because of the work of God that he had done in their hearts, none of those thoughts came to their mind. I believe that these are changed men. Years before they willingly sold Joseph, we can see the contrast. But but now there is not one of them that wishes that the cup had not been found in his own sack rather than in Benjamin's. And this time they didn't abandon him. They're not sending Benjamin back. They go with him back to Egypt to try their best to plead on behalf of Benjamin. And when Joseph told them that only the one who had stolen the cup would be retained as a slave, it was Judah. It was Judah who 20 years before had the idea, hey guys, let's make some money off Joseph. Let's sell him into slavery. It was Judah. Remember the the crazy chapter that we had about Judah? It was Judah who sinned with his daughter-in-law a gross sin. It is him now who 20 years earlier had encouraged the sale of Joseph to the Midianites. It is now him who offers to to remain in Benjamin's place. 
two truth principles here in this first section. Number one, this. God specializes in uncovering sin. A reminder here. God specializes in uncovering sin that we think we have hidden. This is an illustration of Numbers 32, verse 23. Be sure your sins will find you out. Be sure of it. All hidden things will be brought to light. Most of them in this life. But if not in this life, in eternity, we can be confident that they will. And self-confidence is one of the great reasons that we continue to try to cover up our sins. Just like the brothers did. They, they had that thing in their past, but they began to cover it up with all the good deeds that they had done. The second thing that I see here is that it is not what we achieve in this world that matters, but what God chooses to do through us. Because self-confidence will keep us focused on what we consider our achievements rather than what God wants to do in us and through us. How many of you have ever heard of or read after Chuck Colson? If, you're not, if you haven't, I encourage you to look him up and to read his story. In his book, Loving God, and Chuck Colson was the former special counsel to President Nixon. But he tells in that book about sitting on a stage in a Delaware state prison, packed full of inmates. And he was thinking of his life that had brought him to, to high government service, followed by his arrest and his conviction and his imprisonment, imprisonment in connection with the Watergate scandal. And he thought about all the scholarships that he had earned as a young man and the legal cases that he argued and won and the decisions that were made from his high office of government. And then he realized, and he says this, it was not my success that God had used to enable me to help those in this prison and many others. All my achievements meant nothing in God's economy. The real legacy of my life was my biggest failure that I was an ex-convict. My greatest humiliation being sent to prison was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. He goes on to write, It is not what we do that matters, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through us. God doesn't want our success, He wants us. He doesn't demand our achievements, he demands our obedience. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of paradox where through the ugly defeat of a cross, a holy God is utterly glorified. Victory comes through defeat, healing through brokenness, finding through losing self. And God often uses moments of failure or moments of loss. Some brought about by our own sin. Some brought about not because of our sin, but by the providence of God, as we see in Joseph's life, to uncover some sin, to break our dependence on ourselves, in the case of the brothers, and bring us to a deeper reliance on the grace and mercy of God. And the moment that we stop defending ourselves and making excuses and turn in repentance to God, we begin to experience His mercy. We need to, let me say this in closing of this point, and maybe in closing for the message, we need to exchange our self-confidence for God-confidence. God had to break down the brothers' confidence in their self. They refused to look back at the sin that was there that they had tried to cover. They tried to cover it with all of the good things that they could. They're trying to live right. They, they, they bring the money back that was found in their bags. They're trying to cover it all with self-confidence. But it's not self-confidence that we need. The world will tell you that's what you need. But the Bible will tell you that we need confidence in God, not ourselves. We need to come to a place of full dependence upon God. Not seeing all of our achievements and all of our goodness. But seeing what we truly are sinners in great need of a of a righteous holy God we need to see that our righteousness truly is as filthy rags in the eyes of God that what looks so good to us doesn't look so good to God 
And our, we need to have complete confidence and dependence on God. Self-confidence relies on the human strength and the human ability, which are limited and prone to failure, while God-confidence acknowledges that God is all-powerful and capable of doing what we cannot do. Self-confidence is often rooted in our own understanding, which is very limited and it is fallible. But God-confidence is built on the truth that God is all-knowing, that his thoughts are are above our thoughts and his ways are above our ways. It's not always a fun process, isn't it? But it's a glorious day when we no longer depend on ourself and our goodness and our righteousness, but we throw ourselves at the mercy and grace of God in complete dependence upon him. If you're like me and you're honest... This is something that we each and every one battle with. It's the reason that we continue to cover up addictions. We'll always find, James, won't we? We'll always find the good, the glamour, the things that we think that we're successful at or good at or achieving. To block out that sin. A great principle here, God's really good at uncovering sin. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsaketh it shall have mercy. Be sure, be sure, he says, that your sins will find you out. The purge of self-confidence. Let me just introduce the second one and read the text. But we see another great principle here, the power of intercession in verses 18 through 34. Let's pick up the story, verse 18. Then Judah came near unto him and said... O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh comes with great humility and honor. And then he is going to rehearse what has already happened in these next few verses. Verse 19, my Lord asked his servant, saying, have ye a father? Or a brother, and we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, speaking of Joseph, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. And thou said unto thy servant, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And you said, Unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall not see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us, except our, if our youngest brother be with us. Then will we go down, for we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So then here, verse number 30, he picks back up to the present reality where he is. All that, uh, verses 20, 19 through 29, he is rehearsing what's been going on. Verse 30, now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. In other words, when we go back and Benjamin's not with us, it shall come to pass when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. And then we see Judah's plea of intercession in verse number 33. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord. And let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? Do you sense the emotion in, in the presentation here? 
We see here the great power of intercession. We see a changed heart. It is such a powerful act of of standing in the gap on behalf of someone else. And that is what intercession is. In our text, Judah steps forward to intercede on behalf of Benjamin, offering himself in Benjamin's place. And this moment not only reveals Judah's transformation, but it also exemplifies for you and us, uh, you and I, the incredible power of intercession in restoring relationships. Judah begins his plea by addressing Joseph with humility and respect, but more than that, his intercession, it is motivated by a deep compassion and love for his father and his brother. He knows that losing Benjamin is going to devastate his father, Jacob. He's already lost Joseph, his first favorite child by Rachel. And now the only other son he has, Benjamin, if he loses him, he is going to die. And so he steps forward to offer himself as a substitute. And his words reveal that he is no longer the same man who once betrayed Joseph. Let me say this, that true intercession requires compassion. True intercession requires compassion, seeing the needs of others as greater than our own. And just ask yourself this evening, how often do you intercede for other people? Just think about our prayer life. Is it more about us or is it more about other people? I know many of you intercede on behalf of of other people. I know many of you intercede on my behalf. You let me know often and I appreciate it. But listen, if we're not careful, our prayer life and our Christian life becomes all about us. Rather than interceding on behalf of other people. You say, well, how how does that change? It begins with compassion. When's the last time we've asked God, God, I need an extra dose of compassion. And most of us, especially the men in the room, could say that. God, give me an extra dose of compassion. I mean, I have, a, I have a lot of judgment, but just give me an extra dose of compassion. And when that happens, you will see yourself begin to intercede on, the, on behalf of other people. And when we intercede in prayer, do you understand this? That we reflect the heart of God when we do that. Who is still right now at the right hand of God interceding for you and I. How many of you are thankful for that? And we have that heart when we begin to turn our focus and our prayer life away from ourselves and onto other people. We see this change happening in Judah's heart. The selfish, brash, wicked brother who was willing to sell him into slavery. The one who was willing to have an affair and commit a great sin with a prostitute, what he thought was a prostitute. This is the same guy. How many of you can see a great transformation in Judas' heart? And now here he is interceding on behalf of his brother Benjamin. God's done a work in his heart. True intercession requires compassion. And we'll stop here. True intercession responds in sacrifice. Giving of our time and our energy and resources to advance others. Judah pleads with Joseph to reconsider, emphasizing that Benjamin is their father's most cherished son, especially after the perceived loss of Joseph. He thought he was dead, although he's not. So he stands in the gap, and he bears the burden of Benjamin's fate, and he exemplifies intercession in this beautiful way. Intercession is this. It's a personal commitment to see another person's well-being secured. And when we intercede for others, we step into the gap, bringing their needs before God, pleading for intervention in their lives. And it calls us to identify with the burdens of others. And he's not willing to just do it in word. He's not just willing to to go to bat for Benjamin in word only, but he's willing to act upon it. He's willing to take his place. 
He's willing to sacrifice his own life. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to reflect this love in our relationship, being willing to sacrifice for others, to intercede on their behalf. And this intercession broke the cycle of jealousy and betrayal in his family. And God uses his act of love here to reunite the family. Never underestimate the power. Listen, never underestimate the power of standing in the gap for somebody else. I love the heart of Paul, and I think we see this in his life. And I'll close with this scripture from Romans chapter 9, where Paul wrote, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Notice this. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. Do you understand the weight of that? Paul is literally saying that he would go to hell for his brothers, for his own people. He would take their place on their behalf. My kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Do you see that there is great power in intercession? It begins with compassion. And there's great power in it. But it starts with us purging ourselves of self-confidence. And throwing ourselves at the mercy and the grace of God. And we will just have to cut it off here and pick up next week. The rest of the story next, next Wednesday night. To be continued. Father, we thank you.